Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. And today we're going to be uh, ferreting out uh, whatever there is to know about the topic of hookups. Okay. Mm, Trying to take a psychological look at hookup culture. Well, I don't know about the two of you, but I can make a good guess uh, that we've all had clients and vicarious experience, um, t- to put it that way, of uh, hookup culture and what people experience with hookups. Uh, what I'm aware of is that, in, because I live in New York City, uh, that there, of course, is a vibrant nightlife, bar life, the- it goes on and on, and that hookups are ubiquitous amongst people in their 20s. What people have reported to me has been uh, really overwhelmingly positive. There has been enjoyment. Uh, Sometimes it's a hookup that's disappointing or uh, really a letdown in some way. But overall, the experience that I have been privy to is positive for males and also for females. See, I find that so interesting. I don't know that I have as much of this in my practice, but as you're talking, what's coming up for me is that it sounds like it's this really, this real celebration of sexuality for its (laughs) own sake. And in ways in our culture these days, there's this sort of new Puritanism, you know, and I'm I'm thinking don't don't shoot me here, but I'm thinking you know some of the some of the rhetoric around the Me Too movement is 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 very much that any kind of transgression and and I'm not I I'm not saying that that rape or assault or anything like that is okay okay but but some of the rhetoric from the Me Too movement makes it out so that any little transgression any anything that's a little bit questionable any crossing of the line is to be you know excoriated and met with extreme um, fury and punitiveness but this sounds like just a kind of almost yes bacchanalian enjoyment <laughs> of sex for its own sake and it is very consensual. Right. Uh, it's not always, as far as I'm aware and what I can uh, you know, really infer from people, but it's you have to leave the bar or uh, the nightclub or wherever it is that you are and actually go to someone's apartment or a hotel or someplace. So there's plenty of time uh, if two parties are really not in agreement for one person to say, I'm out. Although, how do they manage expectations? Like, what if one person is is thinking, oh, I really like this guy or this woman, maybe we'll become an item. Do you have a sense of how people negotiate expectations? You know, whether people assume that it's a one night or, or whether it might become the basis for a relationship. In my admittedly limited experience, it is a one night only agreement, and one person may be hoping that this is the way to sort of jumpstart a relationship, that we, that she or he might really like this relationship to continue. But it's clear from the outset that this, that it's going to be one night, it's going to be a sexual experience, and no one is obligated. Nobody's made any promises. Okay. So it's just a given. Mm. I, I, I'm uh, surprised by the explicit contractual understanding that, that you're hearing from your clients in that way. Uh. I feel that m- what I hear is that um, hookups are a little bit more spontaneous than that, that there is more of an underlying anxiety about will it happen, can it happen, uh, will I find someone, 
uh, to receive me uh, in this kind of sexual environment. And even if it's not verbalized, because I think that is bad form for people to verbalize a lot of expectations going into it, particularly around the men that I work with and the young men that I work with, there is much more hope to, to find a love object than they, than they would feel comfortable admitting. Oh, that's really interesting. That, that the drive, the search for the other, which might be negotiated very swiftly in, or initially as a sexual encounter, has a very innocent, shockingly innocent level of secret longing. Oh, that makes me it. so sad. Yeah. Because I think, you know, on the one hand, I can hold this like, isn't this great to kind of find this this new place of celebration of sexuality and our bodies just in its own right? But there's this way, Joseph, when I hear you talk, that I wonder if, if <laughs> I'm going to sound really old, if young people are using hookups as a way to kind of defend against the vulnerability of seeking an intimate, of an emotionally intimate connection. Well, certainly I think that does happen. And I think that there are um, plenty of people, male and female, who are entering into sexual behavior in an almost sporting fashion. Mm. But I think that is that is more rare than the media would report. Um, I feel on both sides that what what has changed is that the courtship roles and the way or the speed with which people are entering into a sexual encounter has really changed. Yes. That it no longer takes a complicated courtship, which which I think was in, involved all kinds of things, social expectations, Freudian superego stuff, uh, as well as, you know, fear of chastisement or fear of being in some way marginalized. Or, or fear of getting pregnant. Or fear of getting pregnant. Absolutely. We could talk, really have a whole show on how birth control has created mm -hmm. a sexual revolution. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. That's a fact. Yeah. So I think that people are have really moved beyond um, these kind of set rules about how it should happen. But I think people carry their souls into every encounter. Yeah. And that shows up in yeah. a lot of ways, which I don't know that they're admitting to each other. Mm -hmm. So what I'd like to suggest yeah. is, while the contract may sound like, we're going to have this robust sexual fun, and then the next day, you know, we'll have the coffee and smooth sailing farewell, but I think that underneath that is a whole other layer of softness mm -hmm. and uh, depth and vulnerability. Is, and the yeah. real agreement is, I won't tell you that. I won't. Yeah. I won't burden you with the secret I'm carrying in this encounter, and we'll agree to have a kind of sporting experience together. Well, I think I, I agree with you. I think there is that, that uh, the agreement is there are no expectations and no obligations. Uh, and underneath that is plenty of feeling that can have a whole huge range from let's have fun tonight to I would like to be held. Mm -hmm. I would like mm -hmm. to experience this or that or the other thing that I hope for from you emotionally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so that is very much there. And people have reported to me many experiences of satisfaction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And sometimes uh, the sort of sweet sorrow or the leave taking in the morning or later that night of is part of the charm. Mm -hmm. Is part of mm -hmm. the charm that it, it ended well or it ended badly or he said he would call me and he didn't. Or uh, she said we could go out to dinner this weekend, but sh she's canceled, you know, two weekends in a row. So there, there is that tender place emotionally in people and a freedom as well. Mm -hmm. To explore mm -hmm. one's body, yes. one's partner, mm -hmm. have different experiences that at times has created some real envy in me. Mm -hmm. uh, having been raised and come into maturity in a very different era 
mm-hmm. that uh, these experiences are available and on the whole positive. Mm-hmm. It's a little bit like a kind of Aphrodite energy, isn't mm. it? You know, that, that this could just <laughs> be reveled in. That, and I'm thinking specifically from the, from maybe from the yeah. standpoint of a, of a young woman, that she could go out into the world and just enjoy her body and enjoy being sexual and have these learning experiences. And, you know, um, I mean, Deb, I guess we're separated from by about a generation and yes. it was an important generation. And I do see people that come in who are in marriages where they're, they've been with maybe their first sexual partner. So they've only ever had one sexual partner. And there, there can be a real feeling of kind of longing and loss about that, that on, you know, this, this, their time on this planet in an incarnated body, they're not going to have the opportunity to sort of experiment and get to know themselves in that way. So there, there is something kind of really wonderful about it, I think. Yes, that, that sexuality is available. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have all of the inhibitions and societal prohibitions, mm-hmm. um, religious strictures. It need not. Mm-hmm. And uh, sometimes when people are exploring and dating and they've had kind of one hookup and some misgivings of should I or shouldn't I, and maybe I shouldn't have, and so on and so forth. But th- that on the whole, it's like, why not? It- it's kind of like, almost like eating dessert, you know? <laughs> that it's not that, you know, so I had apple pie. Well, you know, next weekend I had chocolate cake. And the weekend after that, I had um, something else altogether. And that there is a world out there of physicality Mm -hmm. to be enjoyed, explored, learn how to please another person and how you can be pleased, how the person themselves can be pleasured. You know, I want to say one of the things about a psychological stance is it's always both and. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about Mm -hmm. the the painful side of the culture as well, Mm -hmm. which shouldn't lead to any a conclusion about whether or not people should do it. Right. But that people feel soulfully informed by the spectrum of responses that they may have or that their partner may have. I can think of just hundreds of stories of people uh, coming away from a hookup uh, feeling just deeply vulnerable, uh, feeling that they are in fact more sensitive than they realized, mm-hmm. or feeling pressured by their peers that they should engage in a kind of detached, even cavalier attitude around sexual connection, and that it was almost mm-hmm. shameful mm-hmm. for them to admit, gosh, you know, each person that I'm sexual with kind of leaves something in my soul, Mm -hmm. does something to me, Mm -hmm. and I'm almost embarrassed to admit that to my buddies or the girlfriends uh, for fear that I will somehow be uh, perceived of as weak or overly sensitive because it's almost an ideal in uh, Mm -hmm. in some areas that I should be able or one should be able to have a sexual encounter and walk away and have it be just sex. And that's an attitude also showing up in um, young married couples, Mm. this idea of the open marriage or that it's no big deal Mm -hmm. to have sex outside of a primary love relationship Mm -hmm. because it really doesn't mean anything other than the deliciousness of a sensuous experience. And And I'm hearing that people are often surprised. Well, and I I want to say something about it. First of all, obviously, you know, if this walks into my consulting room, my primary attitude is curiosity, Mm -hmm. right? And there's no, this isn't sort of a question of landing on a kind of moral judgment about this, but it's, Mm -hmm. it's really being curious about what it, what it is for that person. But having said that, you know, one of the interesting uh, kind of conundrums, anthropological conundrums is is about human sexuality as opposed to sexuality among most primates. You know, most mammals only have intercourse are only interested or available for intercourse when the female is in estrus. And that is often made very obvious. 
animals, you know, dogs are in heat or whatever. It's like the male knows when the female is fertile. But that it's it's so it's actually incredibly occult in humans. Like most women don't really know when they're fertile. Like why is that? So what it means is humans wind up being open and available for sex all the time, you know? And it's clearly from a from a sort of evolutionarily biological perspective, it's clearly not meant to be only for procreation. And so, you know, one of the theories is that it's a lot about pair bonding. So that makes perfect sense to me. And and I will tell you that, you know, along with the clients that you're mentioning, Joseph, I mean, it 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 like of course having sex with somebody makes you feel differently about that person. You know, there was this movie that came out in the 90s with Lyle Lovett called The Opposite of Sex, and he talks about it's I kind of love this quote he says that sex is like biological highlighter. That if, you know, if you and I have had sex the next time that I'm in a room, you're the first person I look for. That's, Mm -hmm. you know, I I think that's true. There's a connection. So so it's not, it's not surprising to me that even, even in an encounter, like we feel differently about that person the next day. And it, it, it's not a conscious decision. We, you know, it's, it's sort of our deep biological programming responding now. That doesn't mean you can't do it and have it be wonderful. But I but I also think we're naive if we pretend that we don't have some sort of biological substrate that we're operating on top of. I absolutely think, that, as you were talking also about the biological function, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that humans, human women, uh, are the only mammals that have orgasms, that other creatures... Uh, females do not experience orgasms, which goes to your discussion mm-hmm. about there's another dimension um, for why yeah. humans couple and why animals only couple seasonally in a certain way. But there's so much other intensity mm-hmm. that the human body is able to experience around yes. sexuality. And and I wanted to just add, because uh, because I live in Virginia Beach, I have a fairly... A large, long-standing practice with military and mostly mm-hmm. men, mm-hmm. and I, I really want people to appreciate the tremendous pressure mm. that young men experience in the military to participate in hookup culture as a form of initiation, mm. which I think is the old hackneyed idea mm. that women wouldn't want to do that, but men are going to go and get these notches on their bedstands by being <laughs> cavalier and mm-hmm. detached. Yeah or focused most on the physical release or physical pleasure of sex. But I am finding, and particularly in young military men under 30, that that is very difficult for them and very painful. And that uh, the wide majority of these young military men have powerful romantic imagery in Hmm. their minds. And if, if left up to them, most of them, would not participate in hookup culture. Wow. And I was surprised before I started working Mm -hmm. with military because I think we have a certain cultural idea about um, men in the military Mm -hmm. and a a certain kind of sexual Mm -hmm. bravado about it. I don't find that to be true, really interestingly. I'm thinking about your use of the word initiation and uh, whether the culture of the military with... uh, is sort of stereotypical macho overlay uh, kind of forces this on young men who wouldn't necessarily choose it or aren't ready for it versus an initiation. And what is an initiation? But an initiation that changes one somehow, Mm -hmm. that someone is ready for. Uh, that brings a person a- alive to himself or herself in a new way and can leave a glow of having experienced something special, wonderful, exciting, even breaking you know, the rules, in quotes, uh, in some way that liberates them from an old self into a new self. I'm sure it can work both ways, but a premature initiation is is a very different thing from uh, when one is really ready for it. (laughs) 
I would totally agree with that, by the way, being pressured into yeah. it, what is supposed to be an initiatic encounter and then having it just be traumatic or distressing. But I'm also beginning to feel as we're talking that hookup culture uh, for women and hookup culture uh, for men, talking about it in broad cultural strokes, means something different. And particularly mm. since there has been an age-long pressure along the lines of initiation that men should have many sexual partners, that they should even be cavalier about their sexual partners. But when they're you know, getting ready to be married, they should take uh, it serious in terms of the choice of, choice of a spouse. Well, women historically have been so oppressed and so controlled sexually. And so uh, for women, if, if we dare make broad uh, strokes of uh, comment like that, for women, it is liberating in many, many different levels because it is culturally a new day. Mm -hmm. for women to be so, able to so in some, be in that some free. some cases, what, what's coming up is, uh, you know, each of the sex, each of the sexes is, is so, sort of breaking out of what has been the traditional expectation that it's doing the opposite of that. Maybe that is kind of initiatic or, or growth promoting or something mm -hmm. like that. I just want, I want to sort of bring in a slightly different point, which is that I don't have, I don't see many folks in their 20s um, but I do see some, and I, but I do work with a number of mothers who have teenagers mm -hmm. and, or, or young adults. And what I can say is that relationships, whether or not they, they are sort of physically, uh, consummated those first love relationships when you're a teen or a young adult can be shattering I mean, it really, I'm to the point where I hear these stories about these wounds that these kids experience and the kind of tailspin that some of them go into after a failed love relationship. And let's face it, you know, when you're 16 or 17, most of them are going to fail in one way or another, you know? Yeah. I mean, thank goodness, right? Because, you know, that, that, wouldn't, that wouldn't necessarily be a good outcome to wind up getting married mm -hmm. to your, your uh, sweetheart if you're 16 or 17. But... That, that for some of these kids, so there's this kind of, there's this way that it can be liberating and uh, joyful and kind of accessing this different part of yourself. And there's a way that a first love relationship, when you, when you put your emotions on the line and you enter into that and you become intimate, whether it involves mm. sex per se or not, can be kind of emotionally perilous. Yeah. So mm -hmm. maybe in a way what we're circling around here is feeling mm. of how does a person feel about a teenage uh, crush, not, not to minimize the emotional import of it, versus a hookup when one is in one's late 20s or early 30s. And then on the negative side of it, with all the Me Too movement of sexual advances that are not welcome, and with and women taking control of their own bodies, of they can be sexual if they want, without mm -hmm. fear of pregnancy, and they can push back and say, "Don't you dare uh, touch me." Mm -hmm. Where where I think we're going, if I would put a big circle around this, is the problem is that hookups shouldn't be a culture. Hmm. Because when okay. it becomes a That's culture, then there is a feeling that the collective uh -huh. is telling the individual, this is a value. So whether the value is sexually oppressive or whether the value is do it, do it, do it. Hmm. Either way, it's somehow distancing people from their, how unique and individual they are over their lifespan, but in any mm -hmm. given moment. Yeah, so I think point. the real story we're coming to is... When somebody is ready to be very sexually exploratory and to really initiate themselves into the joy of the body, that's the right time for them. Mm -hmm. and, and if somebody is delicate and secret about their sexuality and deeply romantic and has just a burning desire for the one other, well, then they have to find their perfect time mm -hmm. and that the pressure to hook up would be violent to mm -hmm, them in mm -hmm, a certain way or yeah. psychologically violent to mm -hmm. them regardless of whether they do it. Mm -hmm. But this is core to Jungian theory that 
the real answer to all of this is individuation. Yes. Is for each person to understand themselves well enough mm -hmm. and to not be pressured and to move in the way that you know, their soul wants to move, mm -hmm. and then it's going to be beautiful mm -hmm. in yeah. that sense. That is such a good point. It should not be a cultural norm. Or pressure. Or pressure uh, either to not engage in sex, mm -hmm. and for millennia the tribe mm -hmm. has determined right. the, the rules, in quotes, around sexuality for men and women. Mm -hmm. yeah. They've been very restrictive for women. That mm -hmm. sex is too sacred, I think, for for the collective to determine how it should be. Mm -hmm. And that's the real liberation. And you've got to have the but, contract with yourself. Exactly. Yes. And this is the new part that we're into, is that uh, it's not culturally determined. And for the first time, women have the same kind of autonomy mm -hmm. that men have had much more of for millennia. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's a new, It's this is a new place. It is. This is absolutely a new day. Shall we leave it there? And transition <laughs> into the dream of the day. This is a dream uh, that was sent in to us with the understanding that we might read it and analyze it uh, in our podcast. The dreamer is a woman who is in her mid-50s, and here's the dream. I am at a family reunion. I see two women on the sofa at each end. They are identical twins. I am shocked. I did not realize we had twins in the family. I see a young child sitting on the floor between the twins. The little girl gets up and is trying to walk. She falls back and hits her head. I try to run and catch her, but I do not make it in time. I am upset. And I can also add that this was the initial dream of someone just entering an analytic process. Yeah, often the, the opening line of the dream will sort of let you know the territory. And here we are very much in the family complex. And, and that it's a family reunion, reunification. So it implies to me that there was a state where things were in disunion. And here at the beginning of the dream, we have a reunioning. And one of the things being brought together are the two twins with the child, the young child, linking them, in my, in my imagination, uh, together. Well, twins certainly can can uh, sort of be an important symbolic image. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They often represent, you know, something that has two aspects, and often one twin carries one thing and the other twin carries the other. I also, what I would wonder, if that were my client is is the archetype of the twin trying to land in the analysis and is the unconscious of the dreamer wondering if i will be their twin yes will the mirroring between mm. us be so perfect that we will look at each other and be in this solar lunar mm -hmm. kind of reflecting of light and perhaps even giving the analyst the advice that, guess what, I may need, or I may be coming in with a lot of expectation around this perfect twinning. And then as if to challenge that demand, which, by the way, can really limit an analysis, mm -hmm. the demand for perfect mirroring, is the little girl who's trying to walk who was in between them that seems to actually be introducing the differentiating, stumbling, trying to walk. So for me, the emotional nub of the stream is that little girl, mm -hmm. you know, and in some sense, the twins to me feel more like almost part of the setting. Mm -hmm. It's like, that's the situation as it is. But the real action of the dream is this little girl who tries to get up and walk. And I'm so curious about the little girl. That's sort of where the telos in the dream feels like for me. And by that, I mean... This kind of like just uh, intuitive sensibility of where the dream might be going. Like, where is it going to? And I'm, my attention is just brought right to that little girl. And of course, you know, one of the things that I wish I knew 
was how old that girl is in the dream. And, and I would be curious about what the dreamer's life was at that time. Or, you know, if the little girl is three, for example, I'd be curious well, what was going on for this dreamer three years before she had this dream. Mm. But it feels like, I mean, this is where the dreamer's attention is, is on that little girl. And it feels important to her to try to, what is it, that she tries to run and catch her, but I don't make it in time. To stop her from falling. Mm -hmm. There's something here about it. My uh, wondering is that this is a toddler mm -hmm. uh, who may just be learning to walk or may not be, you know, altogether uh, really easy in her stride. And I'm thinking about here are these two women, the identical twins, on the sofa, the child is on the floor. So there's a triangle with two up, one down. Mm -hmm. uh, the one that is down, the young part, the, the child, a little girl, all girls, all female. Yes, I noticed that. Tries to get up and walk and falls and hits her head. Now, kids who fall usually land on their rear end or on their knees or on an elbow. So there's something interesting about hitting hitting her head uh, where what takes place in the head for a child. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. other, there's thinking and cognition, feeling uh, that the injured part is up up yes, the here yeah. and the body of this little girl is is awkward or not skilled or maybe just very, very young. So it feels like there's a split, a difference between physicality and head. And the dreamer, the dream ego, as we often refer to it, cannot catch her. Uh, I don't make it in time. I am upset. Yeah. But, but if we take the attitude that uh, the dream is always correct and the dream ego's position is yes. the one that's problematic... Yes. Then it would. Then we have to question again her impulse to to grab the child, to stop it from falling. That there also is a certain, perhaps symbolic intelligence, in the child's robust efforts to walk yes. and fall and walk yeah. again. Yeah. Yes. You know, one of the things that I would be likely to do if someone came in with a stream, I probably wouldn't do this the very first time I sat with a person, but once we had a rapport, I might say. I want you to try to reimagine the dream and put yourself in the body of the child, sort of experience it through the child's eyes. And Joseph, what I would expect, you know, if I were going to have an imagination about it, it would be something along the lines of like, I think the child's okay. Mm -hmm. It's possible. I mean, you know, sort of rephrasing what you said, the least trustworthy attitude in the dream is that of the dream ego. Mm -hmm. And so it's very possible that the child is okay, and it's the dream ego that isn't in touch with that okayness. Mm -hmm. so yes, that not sure if the child is robust enough to mm -hmm. get up and tumble down a little bit and get itself back up. And this is in, this um, taking in what both you said is that the twinning image could actually be the problematic image, mm -hmm. because if we think of the union of the similars. It could represent a certain kind of static condition yeah. Yeah. where everything is is met so so identically. And then the child There's not the, room for differentiation. Yes. Yeah. So the the child image comes in with a kind of agency and independence and activity that the twinning demand limits. Yeah. So yeah. I think it's a very, it's a propitious dream. Yes. I, I think it's certainly. really encouraging. Es especially actually. because it's an initial dream, and Jungian tradition has it that the first dream a person brings to analysis uh, is especially symbolic, and can often sort of be a a template or a hologram of the kind of work that needs to be done of this young part who needs to differentiate, needs to be able to run, says the dreamer, um, and falls back uh -huh. and hits her head. And how do we help this person find that part of her that needs to run? Find their stance so they're not falling and then yes. progress forward to 
walking and running and all the exactly. agency, all the activity that they could be uh, capable yes. of. And aliveness. And, and uh, I think that feels like the right place to leave it for today. Yeah. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.